eyes and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. Good morning. I'd like to welcome those who are watching this TV program this morning to stay with us. Be blessed by the preaching of God's Word. Paul said in 1 Corinthians that God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. In Isaiah chapter 7 and chapter 9. In the Old Testament... It was prophesied about a kingdom. There had been many kingdoms throughout the Old Testament and New Testament times. But this would be a kingdom that would never fall. It would be established by God himself. And it would never fall. There would be no force on earth, no amount of power or money. Not even the devil himself could uh, cause this here kingdom to fall. In Isaiah 7, starting with verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Over in chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with just judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This will be a kingdom like no other. This will be a kingdom, the only kingdom that was perfect in judgment and in justice. All other kingdoms that have ever been or will ever be in this lifetime is imperfect. Their judgments are always true and they're not just. But God's kingdom will be one with perfect judgment and perfect justice. In Isaiah chapter 62, this kingdom will be made up of people who obey the Lord. Who obey the Lord's words. All the way through the Old Testament to the New, we find that our God, the true and living God, the God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that God had set forth commandments and statutes for them to keep. And he commanded them to keep it. He commanded them to teach it to their children, to their children's children. And from every generation, God commanded his people to keep his commands and statutes. God has a name for his people, the kingdom. kingdom the kingdom's not buildings. Kingdom's not automobiles, it's not banks, it's not money, it's not the air. But the kingdom is the people who are obedient to the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 62, starting with verses 1 and 2, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp, that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. In Acts chapter 11 And verse 26. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass. 
Okay, Barnabas was seeking after Saul Tarsus, who would later be named by the Lord as the Apostle Paul. And, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. That's the new name that the Lord gives his people. And his people are those that make up his kingdom. The word, the name Christian means Christ-like. It is found only three times in the Bible, and it is in the New Testament. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 and 19, Jesus speaking to the Peter and the apostles. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, the keys to the kingdom, a place for God's people, a place for the obedient believers in Christ, those who do the will of the Father, those who obey that which is written in the New Testament Scriptures. The apostles had the keys to open the door to that. And on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, starting verse 36, Peter and the apostles used the keys to the kingdom that Jesus had gave them. And he says... <clears throat> In uh, Acts chapter 2, and starting with uh, verse 36, and God had made that same Jesus whom you have both crucified, that you have crucified both Lord and Christ. Talking to those Jews that stood outside Pilate's hall while Pilate was questioning Jesus, and he found no fault in him. And they cried out, Crucify him! And Paul and... Um, Pilate was determined to let him go, for he found no fault in him. And they continued to cry out, Crucify him! Let his blood be on us and on our children. The apostles preached to the very same Jews on the day of Pentecost. Made them aware. They didn't uh, shrug it. They didn't beat around the bush. They told them, You crucified the one God sent to save us from our sins. You crucified one that God made both Lord and Christ. And they were pricked in their hearts and convicted. And they cried unto Peter and the apostles, said, Men and brethren, what must we do? And Peter said, and he uses the keys now, Repent. That's the first key that begins to unlock the door to the church or the kingdom. And that means something else goes with it. Be baptized. That's the second key that was used to unlock the door to the church or the, to the kingdom. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Everyone from the day of Pentecost until now or ever will be as long as the Lord allows this world to stand. It is to repent and be baptized. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the authority of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one that was talked back about in Isaiah chapter 7 and 9. He is the king that it is talking about over his kingdom. He has the authority to tell us how God wants it done. In Ephesians chapter 1. And in John's account of the gospel, chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. If we're going to get to heaven where the only true living God there is, where Jesus is, we have to go through Jesus. 
He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no other is. In this kingdom, God has set someone over it whom we've been talking about. Jesus. The only one that God has set over His kingdom to rule and reign from heaven. And how does Jesus rule and reign from heaven over His kingdom? Through His Word. Through the Bible. Through the written Word of God is how Jesus reigns and rules over His kingdom. Many people want to be saved. They don't call Jesus Savior. But they want Him to be their King. You see, a lot of people don't mind having a king over them. You know, you go talk to people over in these kings in the Middle East. You know, read about David and Saul and other kingdoms. You know, these men were put over them by God. And the people enjoyed those who were good kings. The people enjoyed being under and ruled and reigned by a king. And there were bad kings, many more bad kings than there were good kings. And the people suffered ruthlessly under these kings. But you see, Jesus is the King of kings. There is no king like Him. Never has been nor ever will be. There is no other. And God has set Him to rule and reign over His kingdom. The church. You and I and every person in this world that ever has or ever will be that has named the name of Christ. Those who have sought out the God, the true and living God. Those who are willing to be obedient to what the Word says. Those who would humble themselves and recognize, I have sinned against God. I'm lost. And I'm going to hell. And I need a Savior. No one can do it and I can't do it myself. I need the one who God chose to be able to do that. And it's Jesus, the King of Kings, God chose. When a person repents of their sins and are baptized to have their sins washed away and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, you become kingdom people. You become a part of the kingdom of God. Not just when we think about the kingdom of God being somewhere out beyond the blues. You and I now... If we've been baptized into Jesus Christ, we are now, we are now a part of the kingdom of God. That's good news. I tell you, that will make, make joy flow from our hearts to know that we're part of the greatest kingdom there ever was. We're part of the greatest kingdom and it will never be destroyed. I we can think about all the wars that has taken place and ones that are going to take place and all the powerful people and all the money in the world and all the crookedness that's going on, they will not have effect on the kingdom of God in which you and I are part of. We're part of the kingdom of God. We're kingdom people. We have a king. And it's not Barack Obama. It's Jesus. Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Praise God for that. I'm telling you, if we all had was politics and people running for politics to uh, have all we have to lead over us, we would be in trouble and be most people most miserable. Thank God that Jesus was willing to die on the cross and lay his life down. I like that song we sing. They bound the hand of Jesus. Jesus is the king, has been, and always will be. God has set him over the kingdom to be king. It cannot be changed, okay? There is no one can change that. There is nothing can change that. It is there to stay. It is stuck. It is concreted in. You cannot move him. He is the King of Kings. And we, that brings joy to our hearts. That's good news to know that we have someone we can depend upon or rely upon as such a great a king as he is. In Ephesians chapter 1, in the last two verses, or <clears throat> starting um, verse 17, Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, or the kingdom of God, at Ephesus. 
that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of His glory of His inheritance in the saints. He says you can know these things. Okay, it's not a if so, maybe so. You can know it. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward who believe, according to working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ, or in Christ Jesus, when He raised Him from the dead, and set Him down at the right hand and in His heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And has put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. God has made Jesus, he has put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. We are the body of Christ, every one of us. We are part of the body of Christ, which is the church. And God has put, over th put all things under his feet. In Colossians chapter 1. Starting with verse 12. <clears throat> 11. Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. I thank God I can know the truth. I thank God that he has given me his word so that I can tell the difference between the true God and the false gods. There's only one true and living God. All other are false gods. And I thank him that I have his word so I can tell the difference. And the reason I need to tell the difference because of one of the first of the Ten Commandments is that I shall have no other gods before me. God said he's a jealous God. And he gets angry. And he will bring his wrath upon all those who worship any other God than him. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not the God and Father of Muhammad. Not the God and Father of any other so-called prophet. I'm telling you, God's prophets from the Old Testament to the New, God's apostles would not allow any other gods to be present. They would not allow anyone to worship any other gods. And they were so, they reverenced God so much that they would not allow anybody to worship them. You see? And the devil even offered in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, the devil offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world from the beginning to the end, all the power and the glory of them. And Jesus turned it down. He says, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him shalt thou worship. And we as God's church today, the kingdom of God, we need to have the same attitude. And when God's church has that attitude, the world will see it. 
It takes more than just telling people from the Word of God that there's only one true living God. The world needs to see it in the kingdom of God. That there's only one true and living God. When the world sees it in the kingdom of God, guess what they're going to do? They're going to take notice. John chapter 17. The true Lord's prayer was that they all would be one. Him speaking to his Father, that they'd all be one as you and I are. Why? Because when the world sees that the, the church that the Lord died for is one, they'll begin to believe. But when the church is not united upon what the Bible says, the world doesn't want to have anything to do with it. It's our responsibility. Every man and woman in the church, wherever it might be in this world today, you... You, if you're not studying God's Word, you're harming, you're hindering the kingdom of God. If you're not studying God's Word. Think about all the things that get in the way of studying God's Word. And you know what I'm talking about. If these things cause you not to have time to study God's Word, the only perfect, right, and just thing to do, now listen to me, my friends, get rid of them. If something will cause you not to obey the Lord, and it will cost you your eternal soul in hell's fire, the only just thing to do is to get rid of it. Get it out of your way. Because if you don't, it'll take you to hell. It'll take you to hell. We as the Lord's church, God said, don't worship any other God than me. Don't worship any graven image. Now use your mind and think about what becomes a God and what becomes graven images. What he's talking about. Jesus wants first place in our life. It pleased the Father that in Him should all the fullness of dwell. You know what? Your relationship with Jesus Christ ought to be greater than the one with your wife or your husband or your kids. Your relationship with Jesus Christ might be, ought to be more important than your house, your cars, your job, and everything else. Because the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, if you will seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you. But if your love and your relationship for Jesus Christ is second best, if you put your wife, your husband, or your kids, or anything else before Jesus Christ, you have given him second place in your life, not the preeminence, which means first place. Why do we have this world today? Because of Jesus. For by him were all things created. Without him that, there was nothing made that was made. They were created for him by him. And by him, it still consists. You see, it's because of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The sweetest name I know. Sweeter than my wife. It ought to be sweeter her, to her than mine. And our kids. Without him... We could not have our families, our kids. We could not have the joy of knowing we're going to heaven someday. It's all about Jesus, my friend. The kingdom of God ought to praise Jesus. The kingdom of God ought to go to the book of Psalms and learn how David praised the Lord. 
And we ought to praise our Lord the same way. We ought to praise Him and adore Him and say how magnificent He is and how excellent He is. You see? That's what Jesus wants. And it's not something that we're praising some man or putting some man on a pedestal. No, we're praising the one who laid his life down for us and died for us. The one who's coming back someday. And if we're faithful unto the end, he's going to pick you and me up by the angels and take us to be with him forevermore. And it's coming, my friend. As the, day, the number of the days on the calendar, you count them, Every day that you count on that calendar could be the day that he comes back. He's coming. He's coming back to pick up the church, the kingdom of God. And will you be ready? Will you be ready? What do you think some of the things when we stand before God one day, when we stand before Jesus, what do you think some of the things that he will say to us? Do you think he's going to say to us things that are familiar to the world or things that are familiar to him? Things that are familiar to him. In Revelation, in chapter 20, starting with verse 11, John said, he's seeing a revelation, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, Death and hell deliver up the dead which are in them. And they were judged, every man, according to the works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Every person, every person is going to be judged according to the works. According to your service to God, is what that's talking about. According to your pledge to God. According to when you said, when you were baptized, that I'm going to be a Christian. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. I want that hope of going to heaven someday. That's what we told God when we were baptized. Or did you know what you were doing? Anybody gets that water grave baptism and they don't know that they have to follow what the Bible says, didn't know what they were doing. And you're still lost, my friend. Because the Bible says, Jesus said in John chapter 14, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. I want you to know that you can't go anywhere. Now listen up. You cannot go anywhere and find the commands of Jesus Christ other than in His Word. You can search this world for a million years. You can spend billions upon billions of dollars looking for what the Word says about Jesus and you'll not find it except for this book. I'm telling you, it would be much harder for me to travel around the world looking for what His Word says, then I have something that I carry with me every day in my home, at the church building, at work, and all i got to do is open it up. Don't take no energy at all. Don't cost anything. But yet some people want to make it harder. Some people want to spend more money, want to go farther than they should go to try to find the truth. When God knew, in His almighty power and wisdom, He knew that He could give us something that it wouldn't take very much to ha uh, get to to find out the truth. In America, all people have a Bible. 
they don't, they can find it somewhere. It's there. It's everywhere. In Revelation chapter 21... In verse 27, again, John's revelation. <clears throat> and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. My friends, God does not look at his kingdom in this way. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore is no, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. Okay? Now you might have been baptized and are continuing to walk after the flesh. Listen up. You may have been baptized and are continuing to walk after the flesh. And if you and I are, that walking after the flesh will bring forth death, the second death, as we read in Revelation chapter 19, or chapter 20, the second death. We're to walk after the Spirit, the Spirit of the Almighty God, after the written Word. I tell you, we ought to be spending time in God's Word. We ought to be less time in other places and doing other things, and more time in God's Word. When we stand before God, He's going to tell you the same thing. You should have spent more time in my word and less on other things. In our society today, in our society today, a lot of times when we don't accomplish what should be done, we say, oh well. When you and I stand before the Almighty God and we have accomplished what He said to do, He's not going to say, oh well. Okay? He's going to say, depart from me. If J. Jones does not study to show himself approved unto God, he's going to say, depart from me, J. Jones. I don't know you. Wow, that's going to be terrible. I don't know you. Don't open your mouth or nothing. You're done for. You're going to the lake of fire. Your name is not in the book of life. I find no record of it. You have done nothing I told you to do. Listen up. You've not done what I told you to do. If you're not studying God's Word, you could never possibly know how to do what God said to do. You could not know it. You could not know it. I could be up here preaching about the mark of the beast and other things. But I want you to know the greatest threat to the kingdom of God is the lack of studying God's word. You have a responsibility to study God's word as a Christian today. Why? So that you can become someone who can lead others to Christ. You see, yeah, I want to go to heaven. It's great. But I can't be stingy with it. I need to tell other people so they can go too. And if I'm not studying God's Word and God's not molding me and making me, I can't tell people about Jesus. And I won't tell people about Jesus. I'll become involved in myself and do what I want and what I pleases me and not God. I'll always reject what God wants and I'll be on top and doing what I want to do. Does it sound familiar? If my wife and I don't stay married, if the church does not stay together, it's not because of the devil. It's because of you and me. We didn't study. We didn't submit to the God of this Bible. 
in every aspect of our Christian life. If we do not stay married as Christian couples, if we do not have the love for the Lord Jesus Christ as God wants us to do, it's because we are not studying God's Word. We're spending our lifetime not studying God's Word. After 50 years as being a Christian, surely we have studied and read through the Bible. If not, what in the world is wrong? Do you think we're going to get away with it? When we stand before God? No, we're not. I know. God knows me. There's not a thing I can say if I haven't studied and studied and studied. You see, when I stand before Him and He looks at me with those piercing eyes, then I won't be able to say a thing. I'll already know. Like I know now. And what about you, Christian friend? Are you familiar with the Bible? How long have you been a Christian? How familiar with the Bible are you? If we had a Bible bowl today, how much of the Bible could you present and win? Or would it be, I don't know that. I should have studied. That's not good enough, God. One of these days, you're not going to have the opportunity. And I ain't either. We need to study, my friend. We need to study for our own individual sakes. We need to study the Bible. We need to see one another studying. You need to stop doing what you're doing and study. Study. If it takes kicking me out of here, the last thing I want you to do is study. I don't care if I'm here or not. I want you to study. Your relationship with God, you are be able to talk to Him like you do other people. He's not so far away that He can't hear. You need to study and grow, have a relationship with the Lord. Spend time with Him in prayer. There's a lot of things I can be preaching on. But I'll tell you, one of the things I think most often is the Christians who didn't make it to heaven because they wouldn't pick up the Bible and study it. Just think of all the preachers that died and went on. That preach a lot more bold and harder on it than I do, or Steve does. Hoping that they got the job accomplished. Without studying, without being consistent in prayer, my friend, nothing else is important. Nothing else is important. You, if you lose that and give that up, well, then you're giving up your eternal life and with Jesus someday. That's got to come first. Now think about what you did last week as I close here. From Monday to Sunday, where did you spend your time? I know some got to work, and there's rules by God at the job. There's some school, some other places. But at the end of the day, how much time did you spend with God? Think about it. And then ask yourself the question. You know, when we're baptized in Christ, we're married to Him. We're the bride, and he's the bridegroom. What if I just walked out in Joanne's life and she didn't hear from me for a month, maybe two months, three months? What kind of conclusion could you draw out of that? <laughs> Do you know just because you've been baptized into Christ doesn't mean that you're growing and having a relationship with God at all. How long has it been, my friend? Listen up as I close. Listen up. How long has it been since you, for yourself, opened up the Bible and dug in it and dug in it and asked God for wisdom 
and have that their communication going between you and God. How long has it been? Has it been a week? Two weeks? Three weeks? Four weeks? If I was walk out of Joanne's life for a month, what, what do you think her feelings and her thoughts about me would be? You walk out of God's life for a month, a week, two weeks, three weeks a month, what do you think his thoughts about you or about me would be? This comes first. This here comes first before anything. This is first. This morning, if you're not a Christian, the Bible says you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. By believing that message, one repents of their sins. Repentance is a change of mind toward the way that you're living and you turn towards God. The Bible says one must be baptized by immersion to have your sins washed away and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not to help you speak in tongues and do miracles, but to help you live a faithful life unto Jesus and His Word unto the end. If you are a Christian this morning, and you're being convicted, your heart's being pricked, maybe you're not studying the Bible the way you should. Maybe you're not praying. Maybe we've got our nose in too many other things. Well, that's sin, my friend, right there. You don't have to be a drunkard or a murderer or adulteress to be in sin. If you're not studying God's Word, you're not praying to God, that's sin right there. That separates you from Him. You'll be lost for eternity. You need to repent. God's calling to repentance. Repentance is changing your mind what you're doing and turn back to God. Start doing what He says.